So this is me first starting out in kindergarten. So at, as I was a child, I was a huge tinkerer. And what I loved the most was kind of, um, oh, sorry, wrong slide, my classroom identity. So when I was in school, how I was identified by my teachers was they would always say, she's a good one. She doesn't cause any problems, and she does really well in class. And while these aren't necessarily negative things, they come, they come with a lot of aspects as a black girl in school. Because what these are, these are statements that I have to uphold, because if you ever become the opposite and you're not a good one anymore, the teachers can make it really hard for you. So it became very stressful to kind of navigate how I was supposed to be in school. So I just held to being a good one, not causing any problems, and doing really well in class. So then when I kind of flipped that to how I was affirmed at home, you know, I, I felt like, you know, just a person who could do anything because at home, you know, what I love to do is hang out with my dad all the time. And he was known in the community as a person who could fix anything. And my dad's family was also known as the people that you would come to if you wanted your car fixed, if you needed help trying to fix your lights in your house, or anything of that nature. And because of that, I loved being able to be the girl that could also do that amongst all the men in my dad's family. And, you know, I wanted to be a part of that. I also wanted to be the person who could fix anything and become that reliable person, which is probably why I love taking things apart and putting them back together. My mom wasn't the biggest fan of me doing that, and her famous quote is she always said, those hands better make you some money one day because they're always on something. I like to tell her we have successfully fulfilled her little prophecy. <laughs> And what I also noticed about my mom, you know, when I was a kid is um, whenever I would have homework or something from school, she, if, if there was a kind of rare occasion I needed help, she would always go to the kitchen. Um, as you can see, our house, that was our kitchen. She'd go in there, pull her phone off the wall, cord just stretched out, and she'd start calling people. And what she'd usually say is like, you know my baby's smart and I have no idea what she's talking about, but do you know how to do this? Can, can you help her? Do you know who I need to call? And she would just like run this phone line for herself to try and get me help. And what I took from that is, you know, she never had shame to call anyone. She would call as many people as it took. And just together, they would always make sure that I had what I needed. And so I drew heavily from community because that's what I was ingrained in at home. And here I have this project I made in fifth grade. And I would say this was my first big community project because this was my first school project. And it is a totem pole, but I probably had at least maybe 10 people in my family helping me to create this project because, you know, I was limited by certain things. I wasn't that great at drawing and I didn't really know how to assemble it, but everybody played such a role in this project for me. And what I learned from that is, you know, I felt so empowered, I felt limitless. I just felt like I can do anything because my, you know, my community was going to figure it out. And I also wanna highlight, you know, these weren't people who had certifications, who had degrees, who had special training but they always knew how to work together to solve problems. And I can't really recall an issue that they could not solve because everyone always came together. So just to show you how true this is, this is from last year and my parents are still showing up to help me when I need help with my projects with the kids. So um, I said, dad, I need someone to saw this wood while I'm teaching, can you help me? Do you have time? And sure enough, like usual when I was little, my mom tagged along and my dad showed up and he did what I needed. They helped out, they did their part. I said, thank you. And you know, the kids got to meet him. So I thought it was this nice little trajectory of my dad taught me and I teach the kids and now they get to see each other, they get to meet. And it's just this continuation of, you know, teaching these various skill sets. So kind of, um, Fast forwarding to today, you know, I work with 
a local boys and girls club where majority of these youth are, are um, predominantly black. I've been there for six years. This is, um, yeah, this is my sixth year. And how we do programming is we run it weekly throughout the school year and we also do summer camps. And typically I work with ages 11 to 12 and there's another group that's 13 and up. But to be quite honest, in a community space, I've worked with all of them. So I really teach ages five through 18. I have all of them. And here I just wanna highlight how engaged they are in STEM. Because most research will tell you, we're trying to get them interested. And I always pause them and say, they're interested if you know how to work with them and uncover that. I'm not forcing anyone in these pictures. These are kids that come ready to work, are asking, what are we gonna do? How can we keep this going? They're bringing their ideas. And so when, when we think about this and how we want to affirm their identities, what I did when I was doing my dissertation work is I really focused on the relationships between myself and the youth and how that encouraged them in STEM. And one way I did that was by coming up with this framework that I called the Black Love Framework. And with the Black Love Framework, what I wanted to do is kind of, I wanted to um, kind of think about, you know, if I were to leave this space, what are the main factors that I would need the next person who entered? What do I need them to do to make me feel comfortable to leave? So I was trying to just name my own pedagogical practice. And what I was coming up with was, a, you know, originally this list of almost 80 things, which sometimes felt like very small things, but I'm like, no, it's not small, it's very impactful. So when I brought all this together, I created this framework and I derived it from politicized care and rightful presence. And I'm going to kind of walk you through that framework because this is how I affirm their identities in STEM. So first is STEM-related epistemologies. I will not admit how long it took me to be able to say that word. <laughs> and so with this, uh, the epistemologies means because of who these youth are, they're coming in with certain ways of thinking and different ways of how they approach creating their STEM knowledge, and it also influences what they know about STEM. So taking that into consideration, one way I do that is validating their ideas so they see themselves as a doer of STEM. And what that means is usually they have ideas that they want to share, but they're very unsure and nervous to share those ideas for fear of being shut down. And a lot of that is rooted in their classroom experiences with science. So what I try to do to combat that is when they have ideas, instead of saying, yeah, that's not gonna work and just leaving it there, I want them to tell me about their idea. I said, walk me through why you want to make that levitating basketball court. Tell me why, walk me through it. And what, they're, what they do when they do that is, you know, they're uncovering so much knowledge that they've put thought into because they want to make this idea. And, you know, by the time they finish it, how I approach telling them that maybe we can't do that is, you know, I say, this is a great idea, but, I think this might cost a million dollars and we just don't have that. And I walk them through just maybe why, the, why their idea can't work. But also I tell them, you know, have you thought about this or maybe we could do something different. And usually by the time we end that conversation, they found other ways to create their idea and they never lost their idea. They've just simply had someone to go through it with them. And this makes them feel like they're a doer of STEM because now they've seen their idea go to fruition. A second point is maintaining high expectations of youth STEM expertise and ability to do rigorous STEM now. So typical 11 year old, they feel that, oh, well, I can't do that, I'm just 11. And I say, yeah, you can, I'm pretty sure you can do it. And you know, I also make a commitment to work with them while they do it. You know, I'm gonna be here if you need help, but you can do this work. Because they've often said in school they get the very easy version of things, almost as, it's, as if it's like dumbed down and they really want to be challenged, but they're so nervous about going forward because you know, if they look around, who's gonna support them if something goes wrong when they're trying to do something they've never done before. And that's where I try to fill in. It's okay if you mess up, but you have to try because we need to know what doesn't work as much as we know what does work. So keep going. I have a high expectation of you. 
And when I have a high expectation of them, they take that up and then they have high expectations of themselves. And this shows them that they have that ability to do the rigorous STEM now. As a 10 year old, as a six year old, as a 17 year old, they can do it. And third is active noticing. So what I mean by active noticing is if I'm seeing something that they are kind of leaning towards, I wanna lean into that and use that to keep them going in STEM. Um, one example is we had, we had one of our kids, he, we were teaching them how to code. He wasn't into coding, but he loved, he loved basketball and football so much. He would just look up characters all, I mean, players all day long. And so I told him, I said, you know, you can make a game with those characters, right? And he said, oh, I can? I said, yeah, you can put them in there. And now he was ready to code. Even when I saw him a couple of months ago, he said, oh, can I go back to coding? I was like, you still want to code? He said, yeah, I know what I'm doing. And I said, oh, okay, excuse me. But, you know, I, you don't want to cut them off. Keep it going if they're interested. So um, this is one of these ways that we kind of do this. Um, I called it cultural stimulating pedagogical practices. But then also comes with that, you know, this just-in-time teaching. So for him to do that, I had to quickly teach him, you know, well, this is how you pull an image from the Internet. This is how you edit that image. This is how you upload and download to put it in the game system and this is how you can use it to create your characters. So I taught him these steps really quickly so he could keep coding in that game because I didn't want him to lose his momentum. And then second is critical relationality focused on the integration of youth voice and interests. So critical relationality means that my humanity, my integrity, and my dignity are rooted in my willingness to safeguard your humanity secure your integrity and protect your dignity. So one of the ways that I usually do that is by collaboration and planning. And what this means is I invite youth to come plan with me. So usually there's no surprises in STEM. We've talked about what we are going to do. And during, during this planning phase, you know, there's a, there's a few things going on. So one, there is being flexible and adaptable. I work in a community space. Things can change at the drop of a hat. So I have to be ready to work within all these shifts. And next is being transparent and accountable. I realize most people don't want to do that with youth for some reason, but I believe in being accountable to them. I need to be accountable to them. And I also want to be very transparent with them. And what that means is, you know, if we are not going to do something, I'm going to tell them why we're not going to do it. Because it's their program, it's their STEM knowledge, they deserve to be as informed as they can be. And this also teaches them to, you know, have a role in your learning if something doesn't make sense or you don't understand why it's happening. Ask the question, it's your education. And then secondly, is critical community building through humanizing youth. So I've noticed that whenever working with kids, most people take their approach like, oh, they're kids, they don't have any real issues, they should just be happy to be in the space. And I push back on this, I say, no, they're people. They are kids, but they are people and they go through things just like we all go through things. And so how we kind of build this critical community is one, I acknowledge how they're feeling. They've had an eight hour school day. Sometimes they're not the happiest people when they show up at STEM. Just like we're not maybe always the greatest people after a day of work. And, you know, if they need a minute, I allow them that. You know, take a walk, get some water, go play with your friends, come back when you're ready. But not only feelings of I'm just tired, but when they come with that trauma from school about engaging in science, when they tell you their teachers are always sending them out of the classroom so they never have the opportunity to stay in the classroom and learn the science that they want to know, when they tell you that, their teachers never let them use the tools that everyone else gets to use when they're always at them about being a loud one in the group even though the teacher has allowed the group work. They feel so defeated and sometimes they're just nervous and that nervousness can manifest itself in a lot of ways. Sometimes they don't wanna participate. Sometimes they overly want to be a perfectionist only to be met with almost a panic attack when something doesn't go right. And I have to acknowledge that because if I'm not taking care of them as a person first, what is the point of teaching them the STEM? So first we just have to tend to them. Second is learning and use of names. So um, I feel, 
I feel more connected to this one than, than anyone because as you saw my name pop up, I have an apostrophe in my name. And I have dealt with people asking, do you go by another name? People messing my name up. And it started when I was five, when my teacher asked, as she said, every other kid's name. You know, first day of kindergarten, she got to me. She looked at me. She didn't attempt my name. She just said, do you go by another name? And I didn't know what that meant as a five-year-old. I was like, no, just this one. And I told her, and she just said, okay, and moved on. And so, you know, with the kids I work with, you know, if you're in 10th grade, you should not be excited that I just wrote your name correctly on the board. That shouldn't be happening. So one, I always make the effort to really know who I am working with, know how to spell their name, never make them feel like their name is a problem. Your name is you, and that is completely okay here. And I realize I'm an example showing them that it's okay. I'll never forget, a kid said, you can have a name like that and be a doctor? That's cool. I said, yeah, you can. <laughs> and you get to tell them to say it right at graduation too. Make sure you do it. And then lastly is um, kind of this space for critical conversations. So they're, again, they're coming in not just as a kid ready to do STEM, they're coming in with the pressures of the world just like the rest of us. And um, they need to have a place where they can speak about this as well as learn. So a big one for us was kind of, you know, um, during the pandemic, one of our one of our kids, you know, we we were teaching through Black Lives Matter, and in Greensboro there were active Ku Klux Klan members going through the streets that night. This was a real issue that was, you know, making them nervous. They wanted to talk about it, and we did. I said, all right, let's let's not do the work. Let's talk about it. What can we do? And um, another big part of that was the vaccines were coming out and they had a lot of questions because they said, no one's really talking to us. They want us to get the vaccine, but no one's telling kids about the vaccine. They're talking to our parents. And I, I asked one of my youth, I said, well, what is it you're concerned about? She said, I have sickle cell and that affects my community, my family, because it mainly happens to black people, but no one has said anything about this virus and how it's gonna affect people with sickle cell. So I said, all right, let's Google it. Let's do the work, let's research. And we did, because that was apparent for her in that moment. And so I also wanna just highlight, because I feel like they never talk about the joy in doing STEM, so I just wanna highlight their happy faces whenever they accomplish things. You know, we have fun in STEM. We have moments when it's frustrating and it's hard to do, but we have fun. Um, here's one of our most recent projects where the kids, we built a stage. I still don't know how this happened, but we built a stage and they've still been playing on it and love to tell you that they built it. And, you know, we go out to eat, we have community dinners, you know, we just have fun. And they can have fun and do rigorous work. Most people think if it's fun, it's not hard work. I'm like, no, it's very much hard work. And so, oh, this is the expanded version of the framework, just so you can, um, can see it. And then lastly, as I leave you, I kind of want you to think about, you know, in your own respective fields, just kind of always remember to ask yourself kind of, you know, how am I serving the whole person that I'm working with, you know, whether it be youth or adults, you know, how am I really serving you as a whole person? And secondly, just kind of think about what are the ways that I can play a role in affirming kind of their STEM identity. You know, even if it's a small role, like with my kids, I'm only with them at an after school program. And it's a, it's a small role, but it's a way to affirm their identity. So what can be the effects of your role? Thank you. Is it on? Yes, it's on. Yeah, so thank you so much, Tierra. And I could see where, um, Dr. Worsley, I can see where a lot of what you've um, presented can apply in post-secondary education context, because it really is about that relationship building. And far too often, in post-secondary context, we treat students as like a number on a sheet, and we don't realize that they're actually human beings with lives and identities and things like that. So just a simple thing like walking around and, you know, when students are engaged in conversations with one another, you know, asking them questions about what they're doing, you know, like what you mentioned with that example of the floating basketball court, mm -hmm. and getting to guide them to, you know, ways of thinking about whatever it is that they're working on. So, you know, very, very important things. So we have time for just a couple of questions. So if anybody has anything that you would like to 
ask. Dan, well, there's Dan here. Okay. So my question is, how you help preserve the momentum that your kids, kids generate? Because I feel like it's easy for a kid to lose their momentum and their train of thought. Yeah, so that, that happens quite a bit um, with this age group, especially when they were able to come back to school after the pandemic. It was a hard adjustment to be in a space. but. Um, one way I do that is I do allow them to take care of themselves. So if they do need to step away for five minutes, that's okay. Because we've built this community where I know they're gonna come back to work. They just might need a minute to step away from the work. And because we've worked so hard to create the foundation, they understand what to expect. Like sometimes I'll say, you know, what's understood doesn't have to be explained. They just, they know. They know they need to come back to work. <laughs> and so they will. They, they may take their time or they'll just, because we like to be accountable and transparent, you know, they'll just come tell me, I'm not feeling STEM today. I promise I'll give it all next week. I'm just, it's, it's not happening today. And I say, okay, that's fine. And then next week they come in they sit down and I don't hear anything from them until we're done. So they've, um, I've set up a, a place where they can name when they're not feeling well and they can take care of themselves. And they also have the opportunity to return without a fear of pushback or they're going to get in trouble. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, thanks Tierra. That see, again speaks to the importance of tr you know, building relationships and trust in any kind of learning community so that students feel like they can you know, step away if necessary, but they're always welcome back in. Any other questions? Uh, thanks uh, for sharing that experience and the stories. I think yeah. that's a really important way, obviously, to connect to STEM, but um, you were mentioning the dumbing down of science that happens a lot, and I hate using that word, but it does happen, especially in a lot of programs where we tell kids everything. I remember working as a facilitator for an archaeology program, and the kids knew what biodegradable was, they knew what terms, and yet I was told to teach it in a very different way, not to allow them to explore, <laughs> and I kind of ignored that, but that being said, um, I've noticed like we have that where that a uh, level of what we don't expect from students and then they get to post secondary and there's this huge gap all of a sudden I hear you know I've been an advisor and students talking about well I'm falling behind in my classes I don't know I, I'm told I don't know enough I didn't learn the right things and so I'm kind of thinking about that role that it plays in education for students you know how we're not I guess properly preparing them, mm -hmm. um, something to that effect, and I don't know if you have comments on that. Yeah, so one of the ways I try to prepare them for that is one, high expectations. I say I put loving pressure on them. Um, and two, I show them that I care about what they're doing because um, a lot of them have shared, you know, they're like, why should I try so hard in class when my teacher does not care about me why should I and I try to emphasize to them you know there's that may happen it probably will that's just the nature of the world all problems can't be fixed but I also try to tell them there's ways you can advocate for yourself even if you are 10 or 15 which is why I kind of sometimes I'll ask them like walk me through what you're thinking so they don't feel helpless and defensive like just I don't know and I don't I don't know and get flustered I'm like just breathe tell me what you do know and walk me through it we can both figure out what you don't know but you have to tell me the things you do know because once they start recounting the things that they know and what they are knowledgeable about it kind of eases them because again this is their own recognition of what they've been able to do and so through that they're able to you know advocate for themselves well, if I know this information and you're presenting me with this, 
how can we bring it together? They've gotten a lot better about that rather than just, I don't let them off the hook with, I don't know. I'm like, tell me what you don't know because I don't, I don't know either. Explain that. So pushing them to do these things that they will probably have to do in the future is one of the ways that we work through that. Love the presentation. I <laughs> uh, love your work. The question that I have, um, to me as I look at your work, there is a disrupting of the power dynamic mm -hmm. that really takes place where youth, young people are seen as active agents, active theorizers, active doers, as opposed to just the recipients of information. And so my question is, what prep work do you do for yourself mm -hmm. to enter into a space where you are as the powered person, as the adult in the room, mm -hmm. actually giving away power, if we want to say that, right? So that the youth do feel as active and agentic. Because as I think about that translation, you know, how can teachers, how can professors rethink power structures so that we don't feel like we have to keep all the power, mm -hmm. but it can actually be dispersed and redirected? Yeah, so one of so how i like to kind of disperse power is again um, i work very hard when things are being set up so sometimes that requires extra work of me past the job i tell anyone if you're doing community work it's going to require more than what's being asked um so they they haven't so, so just to give some background when they have had stem educators in the past sometimes they just pop in and they don't come back so they kind of had this distrust with adults in the space and at the time, the only way I could show them that, hey, I'm going to be here is, was literally that, show up and be here. And even with that, you know, then they, when they get comfortable, they start asking questions. Well, I need help in this, but we only have STEM on this day. Like, what, what do I do on a different day? And I said, well, tell me, tell me what day I could have come in. So some days I've, while I'm required to be there twice a day, I've gone there five times a week sometimes because... I see that they need it, and I want to put forth that effort with them. I understand everyone can't do it, but I know I can. So I do the extra things that they're asking because this helps them develop their own trust. And when they have trust, they're willing to share more. And as they develop that, you know, their power, they see the power dynamics very differently because, you know, uh, we just recently interviewed them, and I asked them, even with building the stage, like, how did you feel about the power in the room? Like, how did you see it? And they said, oh, we all got power. It was our project. We all played a part. And I said, oh, really? All, everybody? They were like, yeah, we, we all did it. Not one of them wanted to take single credit. They were just like, we did it. We showed up. We drilled. We, we did everything. They said, you know, your parents showed up. And they said, I knew everything that was going to happen. You informed me. And so sometimes just, you know, again, giving them more information you know this is why we're going to do this project right now here's the background here's how we're going to move forward if the plan shifts i tell them that hey this is how we're going to go about this today oh well why are we doing that abc this is why we're doing that i never want to just leave them with well because i said so or just not acknowledge them you know i i give them reasons because as i've told them it's your i run your program yes but this is for you. It's not to teach me STEM, it's to teach you. So I need to tend to you first. So that's kind of one of those ways where I really work at like lowering those power dynamics because then when they're comfortable, they're comfortable. They've even told me sometimes, they're like, I don't like the way you taught that. You needed to do it this way. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll change it. And they're like, yeah, that, that'll be better. So even that advocating for this is how I want to be taught. This is what I need. This is a way of lowering those um, power dynamics. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Worsley, for your presentation. Yes. Thank you all. Another round of applause. Yeah, so thanks again for that presentation. And a lot of what Dr. Worsley said, it really speaks to, again, trust, relationship building, communication, 
all of which is relevant in any learning setting and stuff that we really need to think about when we think about rehumanizing post-secondary STEM education. So now I would like to um, introduce my partner in crime who helped pull all of this together. And he is Fred Cheney, the public engagement coordinator for the US um, consulate in Calgary. Originally from Cleveland, Ohio, Fred Cheney has made Calgary his home in the past 25 years and now serves as the public engagement coordinator for the US um, consulate general in Calgary. And he's going to be introducing us to our, what is it, our feature? Feature film. Feature I'll, I'll, use the, I'll use the podium if that's okay. okay. <laughs> 